I'm, I'm uh, very glad to be here. I thank uh, Michael Gill and all the organizers for having invited me. Um, as David has said, I'm coming from uh, Unité Mixte Internationale that the CNRS has in Buenos Aires and that has uh, since the, the January uh, this year also uh, the support of ILRD, l'Institut de Recherche pour le Développement. Uh, and what I'm going to present, uh, part of it at least, is joint work with Guillermo Artana, Gisela Charo, Mikael Chekhun and Mikael Gil. <laughs> uh, just to make a bit of pub de, de cette unité. No. <laughs> no, 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 ça va pas. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> to tell you something about uh, this unit that uh, is based in Buenos Aires, uh, that's Ciudad Universitaria, where the, the Institut Franco-Argentin d'études sur le climat et ses impacts, IFAEC, uh, is situated. Um, the father of this institute is Hervé Letreux, who is among the organizers of this workshop uh, and uh, we are organizing winter schools, the IFAEC winter schools that in the North Hemisphere are summer schools and uh, we, are, uh, we, we are glad to receive, to receive visitors who would like to come so do not hesitate to, to approach us if you are interested in coming. So I'm going to speak about <laughs> Uh, chaos topology and uh, a little bit about the, the methods that we use to compute state space topology and then I'm going to uh, dive a little bit in two applications that concern the geosciences, the analysis of Lagrangian time series and uh, the case also of random dynamical systems. Um, I've uh, put this slide because this is a key word that is similar to chaos topology or topology of chaos, but it's something different. Topological chaos is what I'm not going to talk about, uh, but just to, to let you know what the key word refers to, topological chaos considers the problem of how fluid particle trajectories are entangled in physical space for instance, during a mixing experiment. So it generally relies on the periodic motion of obstacles in a two-dimensional flow in order to form non-trivial braids. And this motion general, generates exponential stretching of material lines and hence efficient mixing. But that's what I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about chaos topology. Another key word that works is topology of chaos, both go well and this concerns the problem of how n-dimensional trajectories or point clouds are topologically structured not in physical space but in state space. So uh, the example you are seeing there comes from Robert Gilmore's review of modern physics. It's a 1998 article where he explains the basis of the method, of the idea, of the approach and there you see a time series that comes from an optically pumped uh, molecular laser run under resonance operating condition. This is the embedding projection onto a plane. And then there is a branched manifold that I will be talking about quite soon. But before, we are at l'Institut Henri Poincaré. And uh, the subject of my presentation is quite close to what Henri Poincaré did. We all know uh, that the origins of chaos theory can be found in his pioneering works uh, towards the end of the 19th century concerning the old and difficult problem of the stability of the solar system. But he also has uh, a seminal uh, mathematics paper called Analysis Situs that he published in 1895 with five supplements that followed and in these papers he provides the first systematic treatment of topology and he introduces the use of algebraic structures to study topological spaces found in the field of algebraic topology that I will be using further and thoroughly in this presentation. So that's a journal de l'école polytechnique uh, where we see the analysis situs. Can I point it here? So now we go to, the, to 1980. 
this is a physical review letters paper uh, where uh, one was talking not about chaos topology but still about chaos geometry uh, um, in the development of methods of time series analysis based on the dynamical system viewpoint uh, but trying to associate geometrical structures, geometric structures with experimental time series. So, why topology instead of geometry? Uh, these images come comes from the book by Gilmore uh, and Marc Lefranc. It's a 2002 book. They baptized the topology of chaos, Alice in Stretch and Squeeze Land. And this image uh, illustrates the fact that when we are in state space, uh, the stretching, squeezing, tearing, and folding mechanisms that act to construct a flow are topological in nature. So what you see on the right is the recipe to need uh, Lorentz 63. So uh, finally you have cubes in, in state space and you have to cut the cubes at a certain moment or you have to uh, fold them or you have to uh, stretch them and these procedures are topological. So that's why topology is important. And in the 80s, there is an, an 83 paper in a review called Topology um, that was called Knotted Periodic Orbits in Dynamical Systems, uh, and it uh, took as a starting point the Lorentz equation. And in this paper, Beeman and Williams, that are two mathematicians, provide a link between unstable periodic orbits in, uh, within an attractor. We've had a talk about unstable periodic orbits and a template that describes a branched manifold. So in the 90s, these properties were used thoroughly to try to identify the mechanisms that are responsible for the complexity of a flow in phase space and uh, to try to classify dynamical systems according to them. What is a Birman-Williams branched manifold? It is a, a mathematical object that is obtained projecting or collapsing all points in state space along the stable directions of the flow, everywhere but at tear points that separate regions heading off to different parts of phase space. So here what you see uh, are the directions uh, in state space, so there are stretching directions, and along the stable directions the flow is projected. So, uh, you obtain, this is one possible branch manifold of a flow in state space, so you see it can be quite complex. So coming back to Gilmore's review of modern physics, there we read that there are three types of invariants for chaotic attractors in, space, in state space. Uh, he classifies them with uh, three categories, metric invariants that are dimensions of various types, multifractal scaling functions, Dynamic invariants, Lyapunov exponents we all know that were discussed by Ekman and Ruel and Abarbanel, and the topological invariants. And the advantage of topological invariants is that unlike the metric and the dynamic ones, they provide information on how to model the dynamics, and that's why they are so interesting. So at the time, we're talking about the, the, the 90s, uh, Gilmore and co-workers had a dream which was trying to establish a sort of periodic table of elements of the different dynamics. And they quite did this using knots in three dimensions. So there you have very well-known uh, dynamical systems, uh, Rossler, the Duffin, the Van der Poel, the Lorentz, and they are associated branch manifolds. So the idea behind this approach is that to identify a type of dynamics, I just have to identify the branched manifold that is associated to it. These are three books on the subject. The first one I've already mentioned, Alice in Stretch and Squeeze Land. The second one is written by two Argentinians, Natiello and Solari. It's a practical book, a sort of uh, user's guide uh, to uh, three dynamic topological methods in three dynamical systems. And then Christophe Letellier uh, for uh, 
Gilmore's 70th birthday, made a third book on the state of the art, which uh, goes through all the applications uh, to which this approach was applied. So uh, let me tell you how we compute uh, state space topology, or to, to be more precise, how it was computed in the 90s. In the 90s, the starting point was a 3D trajectory bundle, and uh, the output of the computation were not invariants. So, we, have, we are in space, we, in space space, we approximate trajectories with closed curves. This was done using the closed return method. So time series had to be long and quite noise free because otherwise you cannot follow the path of your trajectory. Then you need a topological representation for the orbit structure and there they used knot theory where a knot is simply an orbit in three dimensions. And then you need an algebraic description for the topological structures, and there they used not invariants. So these were Conway polynomials, linking numbers. So this is a Lorentz attractor, and there you have some knots that live inside the Lorentz attractor. So this what was being was what was being done in the 90s. But what's the problem of this strategy? Well, first there are. Uh, there is a serious restriction which I have already mentioned. The quality and the length of the time series must be very good, good enough for trajectories in space space to be reconstructed. So this is not always possible, especially when there is noise. And this is often the case in experiments. So that was the first difficulty. And the second difficulty, uh, which was mathematical, is that state space dimension, if you're using knot theory, cannot be higher than three because knots are not. And so your theory lets you describe problems in which the dynamical system is 3D, but you cannot go further. So what I did in my PhD thesis in uh, the University of Buenos Aires is uh, taking another departure point, a point cloud in, eight dim in n dimensional state space, and try to uh, find a strategy that let us describe the topology of that point cloud. And the tool the, that saved us uh, is a tool introduced by Henri Poincaré. Uh, this is homology groups. And the advantage of using homologies is that they are applicable in n dimensions because the method is not less. That's how uh, Natiello and Solari called uh, this method. And it's independent of the reconstruction of trajectories because you just look at your point cloud. You don't try to reconstruct your trajectory. I'm going to show you a little bit how we did this. Uh, um, so the starting point uh, is a, a group of points uh, that are, however, lying on a branched manifold because we are, are treating cases in which the, this point cloud comes from embedding a time series. So you generally have structure, and the, the structure is associated to an underlying branched manifold. So to describe the branch manifold, the strategy is to use local approximation by n disks, and this allows treating short and noisy time series. As the one you see here, this is a pressure versus time uh, series when, when one pronounces a vowel A in the word casa, so it's just casa, the, the first one. So it's, uh, there you cannot reconstruct trajectories. And, uh, but doing this, you can then find the topological representation for the branch manifold, which will be the cell complex. I will uh, now say what that, what that is. And finally, you obtain your homology groups that will co condense your, your topological properties with uh, a little uh, help of imagination to compute also orientability, which is an important part of the of the study. So these are my, my, the two papers associated to this question, uh, a, 99, a 1999 paper and a 2001 paper with Gabriel Mindley, who was my advisor. And um, since we are revisiting this methodology now for other applications, we have given it a name. We had not at the time. Uh, Mike, Michael suggested us that we should. And so we found this acronym, uh, which is easy to remember, Branch Manifold Analysis Through Homologies, we now called BRAMA. 
So what does Brahma do? Well, the starting point uh, consists in constructing a cell complex from a point cloud, so we need to introduce some definitions such as a patch, which is a set of points around uh, an arbitrary point that is taken as center, and that is locally homeomorphic to the interior of a disk in D dimensions. D is the local dimension where the points lie, so there the Lorentz attractor lives in a two-dimensional local dimension in 3D uh, state space. So uh, covering the, the point cloud with these patches, we can associate patches to cells in a cell complex in the sense of algebraic topology. So for you to have an idea of what this is about, and uh, also to recall what uh, Henri Poincaré did, uh, how do you compute a homology group? Well, the problem in mathematics is how to determine if two spaces are topologically equivalent. Here you have a cylinder, and uh, in order to describe the topology of the cylinder, what we do is to describe, uh, to, to divide the cylinder into pieces. Each of these pieces forms cells. We have two-dimensional cells that cover the cylinder. Two cells are, for example, this triangle, uh, this polygon here, this polygon, and this polygon there. And as uh, an n cell is a set corresponding to the interior of a disk in n dimensions whose borders are divided into a number of cells of lower dimensions, we also have one cell, the segments that uh, form the contours of the two cells, and the zero cells, which are simply the points or the vertices. So the n complex is a set of cells such that their borders are elements of the complex with interiors that do not intersect. We now have to do some further work to have, uh, to, to have a, a good algebraic representation of this tool. And uh, so we have to define k chains in a complex. Those are sums uh, such that uh, these sigma are the k cells uh, and the, the a, i are coefficients, uh, integer coefficients. And uh, we can also define an operator that is the border map operator that calculates simply the border of the, of the cell. For instance, the border of the cell 3, 4, 7 is made of three segments. We have now arrows. The arrows produced an oriented or a directed complex. That's important because that will let us calculate orientability. And if we have a uniformly oriented complex, that means that all the cells are oriented in the same way, all contiguous cells uh, share the same direction. So the, the border of the 374 uh, triangle is made of uh, 37. Well, it's quite easy to, to follow. Uh, minus 4, 7 because the arrow is in the contrary sense, and then minus 3, 4. Once you have this, you can now define a K cycle and a K border. They are just what we imagine they will be, a cycle that starts and finishes in the same point. When, that's a cylinder, but I have cut it. So when I have the point one and the, the, here and the point one there, that means I have to join them. So it's like ha having a cylinder and cutting through. And the same happens with the point two and the point two here. So there, when you go, from one to one, you have a one cycle. And uh, this allows you to define an equivalence relationship uh, that lets you identify, for instance, the red chain with the, with the green one. And with this, we are almost done. We have homology groups because uh, thanks to this homology relation, uh, we have an abelian structure. This group has an abelian structure. And so the n plus 1 homology groups of an n complex are the sets hk that are uh, zk modulo bk. That's the k cycles being homologically independent that are not the borders of any k plus 1 cells. In the case of the cylinder, this gives three homology groups. H0 is made just of one uh, generator, which is the zero cell one. That means that from anywhere in the cylinder, you can get to one without, uh, without doing anything strange, such as uh, jumping over a hole or anything of the sort. So uh, that means that our cylinder has one connected component. It's made of only one piece. I don't have detached pieces. H1 is made of one generator that is this one cycle marked over here. 
uh, that constitutes the only non-trivial loop. The, around the cylinders you can get a lot of cycles, but all of them are homologically equivalent to this one cycle. So that means that the cylinder has one hole or one non-trivial loop. And then there is H2, which does the same but with two cells, and that lets you know if you have cavities enclosed or not. And the cylinder does not have any cavity. If we now turn our cylinder into a torus, that is easily done by relabeling the points uh, on the bottom, 134, 134, so now you have to stick them together to form a torus. The result is the same but as before, but uh, at the level of the connected components, but in H1 you have two non-trivial loops that are marked there and one cavity enclosed, so, so it's different from the cylinder. And now we invert the order of the one, three, four points in the bottom so that when you have to glue this to this part, we have to make a torsion. So that we cannot do in three dimensions, that's the claim bottle. But homologies describe claim bottles as being uh, an object of one connected component having two non-trivial loops at the torus, as the torus, but having no cavities enclosed. Last example, and I promise I go, <laughs> I will arrive to geosciences. Um, there is something we have to do to be able to distinguish the cylinder from the Moebius strip. And this, uh, if we try to do this with, uh, with homology groups, we can't. So the H0, H1, and H2 are the same for the cylinder and the Moebius strips. But if we define an orientability chain on a uniformly oriented complex, we get something that we have labeled torsion chains and orientability chains that allow you to locate if there is a torsion somewhere in your complex. And that's very useful because in the image you saw at the beginning of the branch manifolds, there were branches that are folded. So it's interesting to have a tool that can describe that. And these are two analytic, analytical examples in three dimensions and in four dimensions uh, that make, mar make part of the, the, peer, the PRE I, I quoted before. And so uh, these complexes, well, you are seeing them in three-dimensional di three projections because that, that's all I can show, but the computation is done in four dimensions in the second case. So we can deal with higher dimensional problems. Um, this, uh, this is a Brahma method, but uh, the concept of persistent homology uh, is a, an interesting concept that has emerged towards 2005. And it was, it, it, um, there was a team in Bologna, another in Colorado, and there was a biogeometry project in North Carolina, and all these groups of people uh, found this idea. Uh, in, in which the, the method constructs a series of complexes progressively as a function of a parameter epsilon that, uh, that when epsilon increases, what you get is an increase in the connectivity of a point cloud. I cannot explain that because this is too long, but the important thing to say is that uh, recently, the, these are 2017 and 2019 works, there has been a proliferation of free use software packages to compute persistent homologies. And it is interesting because, well, these are uh, efficient algorithms that we could maybe profit from. The only problem is that persistent homology is not a branched manifold approximation method. It was not conceived for that. It was conceived for pattern recognition. They use it for uh, scanned images to understand how scanned images are made out. So, uh, but this does not prevent us from using them to help us characterizing state-based point clouds. So I'm showing how you can uh, describe the Lorentz attractor with, the, with one of the, of the packages that is called Ripser. So here, you, if you have a, a 532 point cloud of the Lorentz attractor, uh, you get this barcode in which uh, as epsilon moves, you have uh, more and more generators. And uh, finally, the Lorentz attractor, which has two loops, uh, depends on the long-lasting bars. The idea is that the long-lasting bars I give, are giving you the correct homology of your point cloud. The problem is how long. So the problem with barcodes is that Betty numbers that are the rank of the HK depend on the choice of epsilon max. If you put, move epsilon max here, you have 
uh, H1 made of a lot of generators. So that's somewhat arbitrary always. So that's one problem. And then H K generators are not provided as output. So if I want to see how my point cloud is structured, I don't know which bar corresponds to which cycle. So that's another little problem that can be solved. Uh, and then orientability pro properties are not computed. So uh, in fact, the problem, the origin of the problem is that these complexes are constructed with a number of cells that largely exist exceeds the number of points in the point cloud. So if you have a big point cloud, as the one I will show you later with the LoRa's attractor, uh, you cannot use this because uh, you have to diminish the size of your point cloud or you have to do uh, supplementary treatments of your point cloud. So big point clouds are generally not supported. And uh, then the complexes are constructed with K cells that have a larger dimension than the local dimension of your manifold. So this also causes problems. So even if it is not fully adapted, um, it is a tool that exists and it has been developed lately. There are a lot of applications in various fields of science of this approach. But I'm going to try uh, to speak of, of two uh, applications we have been working on, and this is Lagrangian time series and uh, random dynamical systems. So uh, as far as Lagrangian time series are concerned, let us consider this kinematic uh, model that is inspired in a pattern that occurs frequently in geophysical flows. It is known as the double J flow. It was introduced by Schaden in this Physica D, uh, D paper. Uh, and uh, it has a driving force that produces a lateral oscillation of the two counter-rotating gyres. You have the equations here. Uh, in where you have a, a two-dimensional dynamical system with forcing, with a time-dependent forcing. From the Eulerian perspective here, you are, we are looking at the vorticity. Uh, the driven double drive flow is quite simple. Huh? It's, uh, it's just, it has a, a periodic and simple behavior. But what about particle behavior? What happens, for instance, if there is an oil spill in the middle of the domain? Well, let us paint in blue all the particles that are continuously passing through the center point of this domain. This is called streak line to visualize particle behavior. So if you look at, uh, at the blank regions, we can see the transport barriers appear, showing that the tracer, the passive tracer, is invading some parts of the domain but leaving other uh, parts of the domain blank. So if this was to use a metaphor, a washing machine, and the laundry soap is injected in the middle and you put a soak in one of the circular regions, your sock does not get washed or with soap. It gets, it gets, it gets uh, washed with water. The same happens with the triangular regions, which uh, are also uh, quite easy to see. Uh, they are orbiting around the circular blank regions. So what can state-space topology tell us in a problem of this kind? Well, we know that we can start with time series, the position or the velocity of a particle, and that we can embed it to generate a point cloud whose topology is going to be analyzed. So that's what um, we are going to do. And uh, so this is a Brahma topological analysis pra practiced on a collection of 8,500 particles. Uh, what you are seeing above uh, is a time series of the horizontal position, x1, uh, in a time window of 500 units. And all of these 8,000 time series can be classified into five topological classes that are the ones that you see over there. Uh, looks like a metro line. <laughs> program, you have a five-loop structure, you have a Moebius strip, you have a standard strip, you have a torus, and you have a, a structure that has one cavity and one torsion. But what has this to do with our geophysical problem? Let me show you what happens if we now color, we have, we advect these 8,000 particles and we color them with the corresponding topological class to visualize how these topologies are organized in physical space. In phase space, we have already studied them. And so this is a, 
the evolution of, a, of the particles uh, in the problem. And there we can clearly see uh, that if we do this, the non-mixing islands that you saw in the previous uh, virtual experiments come out. And that uh, classifying topologies, when it comes to classifying dynamics, can be used for an indirect identification of particle sets that do not mix with the surrounding fluid. That, that's what we are seeing. We can also use that to characterize the dynamics within each region and to compare distant regions be behaving similarly or to compare the behavior of particles in different flows. So, uh, if we somehow sketch a little bit what, what the situation is, uh, uh, recovering the image in which we injected uh, a passive tracer in the middle, uh, we have uh, the chaotic C, which is characterized by this five loop structure, and then we have the triangular regions, which are characterized by the standard strip, and then we have the circular regions, which have structure inside, so the, the soap does not go in, but you still have sub-regions within the circles, uh, some of which correspond to this uh, sort of, uh, one, it, it was called the one cavity, one torsion uh, topology. And then in this uh, red region, that's what happens you, if you inject red particles there, uh, you have in the center the torus, and the torus is surrounded by the Moebius strip. What happens if we introduce now a perturbation in the driving force of the double gyre? To produce a kinematic model in which the particles in the former non-mixing islands slowly migrate to the chaotic sea. Well, in that case, uh, you can still recognize the circles and the triangles, but we see that these regions start losing particles. So in the transition, you find time series of this sort, uh, and as a topology that is computed is always referred to a finite time window that is chosen for the analysis. A particle that is migrating is in practice moving from one topology to the other. Let me show you another uh, kinematic flow example. It is a very well-known example. Uh, its name is a Bickley jet, and it simulates a zonal uh, sinuous jet flanked by counter-rotating vortices, and it corresponds to the idealization of geophysical flow, such as a Gulf Stream of a polar night jet perturbed by a Rossby wave. This is an image from Schleter, Cook, and Davidis GFM, uh, um, in which they show it is a very, they are, these are canonical problems that are used to test these techniques. So this is a velocity mag magnitude and this is a finite time lap of exponent field. So you see that there, are, uh, there, are, there is some structure in the flow. You can re remark your jet and these counter-rotating vortices. So a Brahma analysis on a collection of, now it is a few collection of particles. We have the big one, but uh, Gisela has not yet sent me <laughs> the, the video. This is only 105 time series of sparse particles produced uh, in the domain. And we have four topological classes uh, that are associated to this flow uh, in the jet. Uh, which is the analog of the triangles in the double gyre. We find the standard strip from a, from a dynamical perspective. Then you have the counter-rotating vortices, which have the torus in the middle and the Moebius strip around it. And then you have the, uh, the, background, the background C, uh, where you have a three-loop structure. The double gyre had a, uh, a richer structure, a five-loop a five structure. So, this is a, um, a paper which has a beautiful video. Uh, these are two mathematicians, Banish and Koltai. They are from Germany and uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, this is a 2017 paper in which they study the geometry of transport uh, with a technique that is based on a Freuland's uh, framework, from uh, analytical framework. And so, uh, well, looking at the dynamics through topology from Lagrangian data, we, uh, we have seen that in the analytic problems we can learn something about transport. So the idea is, well, can we do topological coloring of drifters in the ocean? We, and we are working on this. So uh, let me now pass on to the second application, 
which concerns random uh, dynamical systems. Uh, here I have to say that uh, we have, uh, I, I mentioned these uh, schools that are organized in Buenos Aires, and so we had uh, Michael Gill as a professor uh, coming to, to, to give us uh, one of these schools uh, that was called Mathematical Problems in, in Climate Dynamics. And in the school, Michael presented uh, his, uh, the contents of his work with uh, Michael Chekron, Eric Simonet, uh, the 2011 uh, Stochastic Climate Dynamics Random Attractors and Time Dependent Invariant Measures, uh, with uh, the, these uh, equations that uh, for short are called the LoRa equations, the, Laura, the Lorentz Random Attractor equations. Uh, Michael already showed this video, uh, I think it was uh, on Wednesday. Um, and so when he showed us that, I asked Michael, what about the topology of, of this structure? Can we characterize it? How does it change with time or noise? And, uh, and well, he told us, Let, let's work, let's work on it. Uh, um, and one of the questions, for instance, we can ask if there are, uh, is if there are topological tipping points or something of the sort. So I'm going to briefly show uh, the results we have obtained. We presented these results in a congress, in a very <laughs> uh, big, in terms of number of people, congress that's called Statfis, and it's, it was the 27th edition, and this year it took place in Argentina. Uh, and there was, uh, um, and uh, this work we did on the point clouds that were computed by uh, Michael Chekhun. And uh, well, here I'm showing you the, the Lorentz 63 deterministic attractor for reference, uh, which as you know have, uh, has um, two non-trivial loops, so H1 is uh, is uh, formed by two generators defining these two cycles around the two wings of the butterfly. And if you do a persistent homology analysis, you immediately see that two long bars stand out that are associated to these two loops. Uh, if we apply Brahma to the 3D point clouds, uh, so the 3D point clouds are uh, X, uh, X uh, Y, Z, uh, of the topology of, of, it, of different snapshots of the topology of LoRa because we have time evolving, uh, we find topologies that are uh, three loop structures and four loop structures for two different times. We have to uh, certainly uh, complete this analysis working for uh, uh, as we, as we uh, use a glider for time and for noise. But the important thing here, uh, whether we use uh, persistent homologies or whether we use Brahma is that uh, the topology changes uh, with, uh, with time. So to conclude, um, topological analysis is a program in nonlinear sciences rooted in the ideas that were introduced by Henri Poincaré in the last century. Uh, that is devoted to analyzing and understanding data from chaotic dynamical systems. We have seen that algebraic topology provides tools to quantify the topological properties associated to point clouds in state space without limiting the analysis to three dimensions and allowing for the treatment of dynamical reconstructions from short and noisy time series. Uh, Time progresses along the, along the conclusions. Around 2009, we have this possibility of computing homologies from point clouds using the concept of persistent homologies, uh, which we have seen are not su fully suitable for, for branched manifold identification, but can serve as guide. And then we, uh, we, vi we visited two application examples related to the, to the geosciences, a topological analysis uh, that show that we can classify fluid particle dynamics and that this can help unveil the Lagrangian geography of a flow. And a second application with the snapshots generated with the LoRa, uh, with a topology that differs from the deterministic counterpart and varies with time. And to conclude, as I am the last speaker of the conference, I have, uh, and we come from different parts of the world, um, I have chosen this image that belongs to this book, uh, uh, 
um, by Christophe Letellier for, his, for Robert Gilmore's 70-year uh, uh, birthday that shows that if we plot the, the earlier trajectory, the early trajectory of dynamical systems theory from Paris, in 1880 uh, into the computational era around 1965, well, we find a loop. Okay. Thank you, thank you to the organizers. It was a great <laughs> work. Thank you very much, Denise, for this very nice talk. And now, questions. Yes. That's great. <laughs> I did my <laughs> daily exercise for today. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I guess I have quite a broad question. So uh, big theorems and topology related to geometry, so like gauss bonnet theorem. And I was wondering if there's sort of like an equivalent between these like dynamic invariants that you mentioned earlier. You have this classification. Are there like bridges between them? Mm, yes. Uh, yes, the, the, the problem is that in some way, metric and dynamic invariants quantify complexity. So you know, maybe I have seen interesting works on, uh, for instance, climate dynamics, trying to classify complexity, the complexity of a problem using these, these invariants. But the problem is, well, you know how complex your problem is, but you don't know how to solve it. So that's not very satisfactory. And uh, something I have not been able to include for, for because of the, the time, 40 minutes is not enough, is that uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Gilmore and with Letelier and with the team we, we, we have uh, made up uh, across the world, there is Sylvain Manjarotti who works uh, in Toulouse at CESBIO. Uh, he's an uh, ERD uh, researcher, and he has been developing packages, algorithms, algorithms uh, that can be validated with topology, and that let you uh, give an, uh, giving a, a time series as input obtain uh, a low order equation, so your ODEs uh, as an output. So the interesting thing is that the topology tells you what kind of dynamics is behind your data. And what kind of dynamics me means, well, a Van der Poel or a Rossler or a Lorentz. And if we go in higher dimensions, well, we have, a, uh, we have not a classification as neat as in three dimensions, but you have an idea of what is, uh, of what is really happening. And then you can use that to interpret uh, what's the physics behind, which is not always that easy there. You need some model to start playing and to see, well, if I uh, uh, take out the fourth thing, uh, what happens? Does the topology change? What do I lose? Which is a dynamical ingredient that is lost? So then you can associate a branch of your manifold with the turning on of a, of a fourth thing, for instance, to give an example. But this is the kind of work you can do with that. Yeah, so maybe a related question is, uh, when you have this kind of snapshot uh, tractor, no? mm. then what, what you should look uh, for maybe is this, uh, the recurrence of some of these uh, patterns uh, along the dynamics and try right. to, to make uh, something out of it, right? So yes. that's the strategy. That, that's the big question behind, uh, and that's why we are very curious about it. And, but we have, do, we have to do some, uh, some more work till we can provide an answer of, uh, of how these topology changes and why and what we can associate them to. I, maybe, well, Michael knows his creature more than I do, but uh, uh, we, I, I hope that we will be able together to, to, to learn something about the Lorentz topology and maybe random dynamical systems topology in general, because this is a, uh, we are opening a door. More questions? Okay, then if not, thanks uh, again, Denise. Thank you.